Um, so we're gonna delay this for 15 more minutes because family members need to eat and they're pretty nervous. So you guys can keep talking.
There's no hope here. <laughs> Just fine. He had a very full day. Sorry. 
Uh, I was telling everybody he went out in the morning with his backpack and got supplies to work on the house. And he came back and he worked on the house and he took a shower and he worked on the computer and he had dinner and he went to soccer game and something happened on the way back. He pulled over the side of the road and they found him slumped over the wheel and uh, they couldn't. They said he had a pulse but wasn't breathing and wasn't conscious and worked on him for 30 minutes and didn't come back. We don't know if it was a heart attack. There was never any sign. He had an operation two and a half years ago. And, um, you know, the third week we started walking around the neighborhood, did our shopping with our backpacks. And, you know, so he was healthy. So I don't know what to say. Everybody says they don't know what to say, neither do I. It was just, it was a total shock. So I, you know, I, Probably could say a few personal things. You know, everybody knows our family. My children will probably say something. I don't have to tell you too much because Mike Brennan says he's got a whole thing from Kirk, you know, his whole entire life, and he doesn't. He's either going to wrap it up or you know, he doesn't know whether he should start or he should end this. But but he's got it settled. So anything we miss, we'll talk to Mike. <laughs> and um, but anyhow, he um, Kirk. Kirk was, he just loved people. He was gone all the time. Sometimes I wasn't that happy about it, but, you know, but he really did love being around people. And you could see, you know, like we got a message from Japan in Japanese that said, you know, a horrible rumor is going around Japan. <laughs> you know, that, you know, something happened to him. And, and my daughter translated and read it to us a little bit of broken English, but, you know, the sentiment is there. Hi, Chris. You didn't see me, came up. Anyhow, but um, yeah, Chris is just, we haven't seen him in a while. We, we stopped by a couple, about a week ago and thought we'd get together. But um, anyhow, so he had a lot of plans. He was feeling fine. He had a lot of plans for the house. He was trying to get out of soccer for 20 years or something. <laughs> <laughs> he handed off um, his uh, MUS league that he started um, back in. 77 and he ended up to I don't know I think they had luck because they're having some type, type of trivia game that Kirk had planned but they had to take over but he was so happy that those guys the work they'd done and everything to take over his league um, it was a big part of his life anybody that knew him knew you know they knew a lot of people knew outside but they knew him mostly from soccer um, there's some carpenters here that stopped by earlier. Um, he was a steward for, um, you know, for the last last few years, the last company he worked for, and he really enjoyed that. He just loved people. He just every nationality didn't matter. He wanted to know your story, wanted to be around you. Anyhow, so so I'm going to tell you a little about the soccer thing that he because I don't know what Mike's going to say, but anyhow, he. When Eric was seven years old, he, he started a new game. They were going to have a new game that they were going to play, and it was soccer. And so I went, took Eric to that, and they, the game it was so cute. The kids were just, you know, it was so fun to watch. And I'm not a sports person. I won't let football in the house or baseball or anything on TV. Like, if you want to do it, you go do it, but we don't watch it. So anyway, so soccer was really cute. So um, I told Kirk, you know, you should go see it because they're probably only going to have one more game and they, because they can't find a coach. And so he went to the next game and he came back. And I said, so how'd it go? And he said, great, it was fun. You know, and I said, so, well, are they still going to go on? He goes, yeah. And he said, I said, well, you know, did they find a coach? Yeah. Well, who is it? <laughs> Me. You know, about soccer because nobody knows anything about soccer. <laughs> so he said, I'll learn. So he started coaching them. Then he found um, we had in the other end of our neighborhood uh, Greeks, a whole community of Greeks were there and they were playing and he just go watch them, watch them, watch, watch, watch. You know, every time they were playing, he'd go watch them. And finally he said, Would you like to play? <laughs> and so he got into it that way. And from then on, they just started more and more teams forming. And, one more leagues and they said that it's he said he did some research and so far we think it's true that it's the second largest soccer league in the nation so 
So besides that, you know, we have to see, you know, he really enjoyed people's company and different, you know, being a steward, he was worried about all the, you know, all the things that went on in the shop that had to be corrected. Our family, we took, I think, I was telling you the other day, I said, I don't think we've taken a vacation that we didn't have to be somewhere for something, and that's why we're going there. But he, when he started the soccer teams, he start, teamed up with some people from Canada. So we used to take vacations in Goderich and Bruce Peninsula, and, and it was a really a fun time to get to know them, and they play a game, and then we have a vacation. So that's kind of how we got around. Somebody's wedding, here we go. So, so yeah, it, was a, it was a very full life that he had. We thought, you know, we were making plans for so much more to do, but, um, you know, now we just have to figure it out. Help everybody else is, you know, taking advantage of every day of your life, because you just never know when it's going to happen. So if anybody, you know, would like to, where, you know, the kids can say whatever they want. Anybody else would like to speak? I know a couple of people probably could take up the rest of the day. We're not going to let them. But, <laughs> so just come in and if you want to come in. Oh, well, you're I'm there. just going to preempt you. No, no, I, I'm oh. not going to speak that, but I just want to say, just so you know, um, my mom was the, you know, she was the operator behind, my mom was the operator behind the machine. <laughs> so she, was, she made everything work, like everything was good at home. You know, my dad always came back and like, you know, even though we thought, even though we thought sometimes he was gone a little too long, you know, and this was just another time that we thought he was going to come back and we were very, you know, surprised. I don't know how many times he was late and, you know, he'd get home finally and i go, what, you know, I was in a panic. I thought something had happened to you. Oh, we, this happened, that happened. You know, before cell phones, it was harder to make a call. So, you know. But after cell phones, still happened a few times. But <laughs> so I, got to, so I got used to calming myself and saying, okay, somebody got injured, took them to the hospital, something happened, something happened in the car, something, you know. And today, this is the one day that I kind of live a little longer, a little longer, because I would have been calling them you know, 10 o'clock until 11. But I thought something happened, and, you know, and then it just hit, and I started worrying. and. When the troopers came to the door, I thought it was an accident. I certainly did not think it was the end. And so it is, it's, you know, it's, I don't know what to say to anybody about it because it was so unexpected for me as well. But I, I, I didn't want to say one more thing. Okay. Okay. Oh, from, from my dad, and a lot of people don't realize this, but my dad, honestly, it wasn't it wasn't an actual day unless he reported everything to my mom because he would tell her like all the stories from the day and all the things that happened and when i was with him on vacation he literally called her three times a day i spent like where i'm like dad it's our vacation like you're you're on the phone with mom the whole time so he actually went to see his sister who's about five years old or so and the, he and andrew went to north carolina to make sure he could see her before she went she's still one time he, we didn't know it was going to be for him but i'm glad he had that time because he got to see relatives that he hadn't seen in a long time and you know he just he loved people and he did not want anything to be left undone so he was working right to the end so anyhow we can talk you know later i'm talking to a lot of people I, i'm sorry this started late i had to get a little something i didn't realize how late it was and Maybe you wait a little bit, but if anybody would like to say anything, I guess Mike's going to go next. I thought I'd share this anecdote that Pam didn't say that she told me the other day. She said I was married to him for 54 years. I think I saw him for 30 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said 50th year, 50th anniversary year, 30 good years of marriage. There you go. <laughs> well, anyway, you, you know. Oh, why yeah, now? I do have to say one thing. <laughs> <laughs> when Andrea got married, she threw the bouquet really hard and he caught it. 
<laughs> I became part of the family. <laughs> I don't know who I was married to that time, but uh, anyway, some people, Harold was known as Kirk, or others Coach, and in some cases, Mr. Kirkwood. It got me thinking of the titles that Harold really had, for example. Loving husband to Pam for 54 years. Proud father of Eric, Andrea, and Laura, and Rosie Browning. Brother to Renee, I don't know whether she's here today. Okay. Father in law to Taj, that's the right, correct pronunciation, Taj, okay. Grandfather to Leona, Kay, and Juniper, I think it is, right? Proud member of his Hochuk American Indian tribe, which you see the blanket there. Soccer player, soccer coach, national coaching C license and referee license, cable TV soccer program uh, organizer. He had his own program. He'd go out and he was on. Uh, he uh, did some games for one of the World Cup teams. He did games for the uh, the people over at uh, what used to be the Pontiac Silverdome. <coughs> and uh, he promised me one day he'd show me the film of us playing, and then he didn't get to see it. We probably did. We did. We did. He was a Ferndale, Berkeley, Madison Heights, and Royal Oak youth coach. Found a member of the Michigan <coughs> United Soccer League, which today has over 2,000 players all due to Harold and Sam Rebius, who's here tonight as well. He's an MUSL uh, committee member, vice president and lead president, founder, manager, player, coach of the Ferndale interest teams, over 30, over 40, over 48, over 59. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah, I was waiting for the over 65 team, but he never organized. <laughs> He was a Wolverine Invitational Soccer Team organizer, the Michigan Association Soccer Association board member, and a Hall of Fame inductee. The MSA Director of Coaching, staunch supporter of Manchester City <laughs> in the English Premier League. I'm glad to see he had a West Ham shirt in his coat. <laughs> He's a Detroit City Football Club supporter, master carpenter, organizer of the Michigan Senior Olympic Soccer Tournament, a union rep for the local carpenters. After game meeting, fellow beer provider and drinker, <laughs> good friend and fellow team player, and if nothing else, he's a owner of the biggest, biggest, bushiest set of eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, what is the thread throughout all those functions? And the answer is <laughs> commitment. <clears throat> How was somebody who willingly gave of his time and enthusiasm, especially for all soccer? As you heard, he ran uh, and was actively involved at all levels of coaching, managing, and administration, and his, his passing leaves a gaping hole in the local scene. There will be announcements about how the MSA and MUSL will be remembering Harold, but for now, we want you to know that you have our gratitude and our most sincere condolences for your and our loss. I was watching the film Belfast last night. And there's a final scene when the grandmother is watching her family leaving to go to England. The caption comes up, and I quote, Don't be sorry that he has gone. Be glad that he was here. That sums up my thoughts for today. Thank you. Thank you I forgot.
forgot to say, say <laughs> I forgot to say that this is being live streamed and it will also be on YouTube at some point. I don't know how quickly that happens, but it's just because we have so many people around the country and uh, maybe even the world that you know would like to have been here and can for their various reasons do that. So um, I just want to let you know, so be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since Michael oh, you that. basically covered everything I was yeah. going to say, so um, can you hear me? All right. Um, I definitely want to make this lighthearted, so it's um, really should prevent me from crying. So, um, and um, and I don't want to take up too much of the time because if you see from this room, I'm sure everybody has a, a story about Harold that they want to share. So. Um, I'll, I'll get right to it, I guess. Um, I met Harold when I was 21. Um, my name is Alma Riley, by the way. Um, we played, I played soccer at OU with his daughter, Laura, um, at Oakland University, and he was our coach. Um, I also served with, uh, Harold on the Michigan Soccer Association board. He was um, a man with a huge personality, and he loved the game of soccer. And he had a greater love for his family that he loved very deeply and spoke highly about. And um, he was very proud of all your achievements. I heard it <laughs> every time I saw him. So, um, no, don't be sorry. Because these stories are like, look, look at Eric. He like he was like skateboarding and yeah, all these tricks. I'm like, I wish I could do those. Um, anyways, uh, Harold had a strong connection with many people over the years, and I wasn't lying when I said he was like a father to me. Um, as you know, he loved the beautiful game, and he started, helped start or supported both the men's and women's soccer in the area. He's the reason why Oakland has a women's varsity team. He's the reason why Shrine has a soccer program. And he's the reason why the MUSL and other leagues and clubs exist. And um, from youth programs to MSA, to MUSL, to Senior Olympics, Ferndale, Berkeley, and many more cities. It's because of him that soccer in Michigan thrives. He had a way of bringing people together, helping those who needed it, and without hesitation, he was honest. In fact, I heard several stories of how he was at the right place at the right time. Uh, I heard of recently of a youth team that had practiced, and he saw that this girl was struggling and unsolicited. He walked over and gave her pointers and even kicked the ball around with her, and that was Harold. So I wanted to get involved with growing soccer in Michigan. And about five years ago, um, I was uh, brought to MSA by Nick Redu. And that first day when I walked in for that meeting, the first person I saw was Harold. And his face lit up and his eyebrows lit up and, and they're all, I mean, they seemed to grow. Like when I, you know, my, my, I could feel like the smile on my face come like right off and go from one side of the room to the other. And we hadn't seen each other for several years. And so after the meeting, we um, we caught up. We, you know, he always liked to have a drink after a meeting or a game or anything. So it was like, wanna have a drink? Sure, let's go have a drink. So we talked about our families and and things like that, what's going on with life, um, how how we can make soccer better in Michigan. And after after that, I decided I wanted I wanted to stay on board. It was because of Harold who talked basically talked me into saying that I wanted to make soccer better. That man's personality is unmatched, and everyone knows Harold. When people think of adult soccer, for sure it's Harold. When you want something started, you call Harold. You call Harold. If you have an issue with someone, he's the guy to mediate. And if you want to send someone to a meeting in a room full of angry people, you send your heart 
<laughs> so, um, Harold was a Michigan um, Soccer Hall of Famer, the director of coaching for MSA, and one of the founding fathers of the MUSL, who was also their president at the time of his passing. An ambassador to many people of race and culture, he saw no color, and he did, he did not discriminate when it came to age or gender. He just wanted everyone to play. And there's a joke among, among his teammates and friends and fellow board members that went something like, Harold was always waiting on the docks for the immigrants to show up. <laughs> and from what I understand, he was very proud of that statement because he wanted anyone moving here to have a, a place to play soccer. He was truly an exceptional man that cared for others and at times to a fault. If someone he loved was hurting, so was he. It was always a treat to get him to hang out. I'll never forget his contagious laugh and his lighthearted spirit. He taught me so much and I attribute the person I am today to Harold. Because of him, I was a tougher, tougher player. I was able to contribute to our soccer community and overall a much better leader through his advice. So I know that many of you are angry that Harold was taken from us early, but I would like to ask you to, to give forgiveness and celebrate his life with me. I challenge you to be more involved with soccer in his honor and get certified as a referee or become a coach <laughs> because that's what he loved was being a coach. And to get out and play and introduce people to the sport. That's what made Harold happiest. And find that piece of Harold within yourself and continue his fun-loving legacy in the way that will make you remember the person that we all knew and loved. The unconditional love he had. He was a role model, a caring and supportive husband, father, grandfather, son, brother, cousin, and one of my greatest friends. I'll truly miss him every day for the rest of my life. And let us remember the way that he touched our lives. So I'd like to leave you with what I feel directly represents the way in which I and others choose to honor and remember this wonderful, funny, charismatic man who was such an integral part of my life and the lives of so many others. So the MSA board has decided to celebrate his achievements by renaming the Men's Over 30 Cup to the Harold Kirkwood Over 30 Cup. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, thank God I'm getting through this. I'm done. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I wanted to say to Harold directly, and I know he's watching, um, that we truly cherish every moment we were able to spend with you, and we know that you are at peace now. do this yet, but <laughs> I actually think I just want to look at all of you and take this in for a minute because
Harder when you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's, it's so wonderful, you guys, all of you. It's so beautiful. Because I only have a point of reference of myself and my immediate family to know. And in contrast to, to a lot of people that I do know that when you when you have the kind of parent that that never holds back in telling you how they feel about you. The kind of parent that when you run into people on the street and they find out who you are, <laughs> they tell you what your parent told them about you. <laughs> When you have that kind of parent, you just really feel like you can do anything and go anywhere and just be yourself. You just. <sighs> you just feel this beautiful confidence going through the world. And um, and it's really strange because I've told people that are here today and people that have come through. Of course I'm sad, but when you when someone gives you all their love and they share it with you so often like you did. And you can give it back to them. You just, you just know how much you share that love. Then even when they're gone, it's only there's only one thing that you regret, and that's just not having more of it. You know, I like don't feel sad at his passing because. There was nothing left unsaid. I really feel so filled with love about my relationship with my dad. And it's like, you know, I, I just feel so much gratitude and so grateful. And I feel grateful for all of you being here. It's so nice to see all your faces, all the things people have written. Because I know, I know all those things you wrote like tenfold. And, um, we all go. We all go. I like my dad was the kind of person who shared so much about his beliefs and his loves and his dreams and everything, good and bad. That one thing I've always known is that we we're gonna go. We're all gonna go. That's what we do. I have no illusions to that. I'm not even afraid of it for myself or anybody else. We all go. I'm just so sad that I don't get to work on the house at the moment. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sad that I can't call him and get his insights. But um but I feel so fortunate and the one thing I'd say is the people you love, you know, don't don't forget to let them know, you know, because then you you don't have to find this happening and have regrets. I don't have regrets. I just want more, you know, but I don't have regrets. <clears throat> he was the most beautiful human. You know. He just never did anything. He never did anything to 
try and get credit for it. So it didn't, he just didn't, he didn't care at all about that. He literally just did things because he was compelled, because he was like that kind of person. He wanted to do whatever he could in this world for all the people around him. And, uh, and it was awesome because I feel like where he came from, the less privileged someone was, the more he wanted to be there for. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's rare. I think everybody wants to be that, but he was that. He was that. And, uh, yeah, it made him so cool. Um, yeah, sorry, it's really, it's really hard to sound eloquent when you're talking about your hero. But thank you all for coming here. It's really a pleasure to see you. Well, I'm very nervous because I forgot my glasses, so I can't read my speech. And I also don't have a speech. <laughs> no, I didn't have one. So I'm just going to sort of talk here. And then I also heard this is live stream. And I heard that Carol told everything to Pam, all the stories of everything that happened in the past, which really makes me nervous. <laughs> so should I say a different name? <laughs> no, my name is Genevieve. And I actually forgot about this. Memory is not always the greatest thing. I forget a lot of things. But I actually met Harold back in, I think, 1984 or 1985. And I remembered this miraculously because there's a picture back there. And there was a whole bunch of kids in these little t-shirts and cutey looking outfits and boys and girls. And they're in a gym. And I think I remember it being in Ferndale. And I don't remember how, but I was asked to come and play. Do you guys remember this? So I was able to go out there and play with all these boys, and I thought it was the coolest thing. And obviously, somebody invited me, but I don't know how I came all the way over to that area when I was a little bit further north. But I remember from that moment, wow, this is really cool. This guy really must be coaching soccer and playing soccer forever. Of course, now I know that's not the case. Um, the next time, so that was for years. I just kept seeing him everywhere I went. Every time he went to an indoor game, he was there, hanging out on the sidelines. Hey, how are you doing? Always smiling, of course, talking to everybody. And he also, um, I, along with Elma, I played, I think before you, though, from the club. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I played. I was in the very. Yeah, so I played um, on the club team at Oak University also. Was it before you were at the same time as you? It's on the floor. It didn't show up till I showed up. Okay, well, there you go. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> we had a coach in Delora over there. Okay, great. You're no right. It's all your kids' fault because they're the ones that said you could be coaching. But anyway, played in that club there, and it was pretty great because he is just so easy, and he was one of those guys, and I'm sure everybody here that knows him knows this. He was one of those guys that could just, he waited a minute before he spoke. He kind of was this great listener. And he would sit there and he would just look and he would be calculating exactly how he was going to deal with every single person as an individual. Rather than just like, okay, everybody, this is what we're doing. And half the girls would cry and the other half would be like, what am I doing? And they'd do all these things. But he was so intentional with how he treated every single one of us to make sure he kind of got right through to us in the way that we needed to 
be here. And just so everybody knows, I was his favorite player. <laughs> and I'm totally not. That's not true. I was not his favorite player. Actually, we had very much of a love. He adored me, but we had very much of a love-hate relationship. I was very tough. I'm not gonna lie. I'm glad. I'm sure he was glad that he had the daughters and son that he had because he wouldn't have chosen me. I was not, kind of. Yeah, I was a little bit rough. But anyway, I'm sure he he did. He had this thing. Sometimes I do these things and maybe there was a red card or a yellow card here and there but he <laughs> and he had just this he looked down and he was just like oh yep that's Genevieve oh boy here we go but I will say that I have had three mentors and people in my life that have changed who I am and honestly he is absolutely one of them and the other two oddly enough there was one um Paul Farron, I'm sure maybe many of you know who he is, and I was hoping to see him here today, but maybe you'll hear me on this while reading my speech without my glasses on the live stream video. Um, he was one of my mentors also, and then I had one other, Ernie, and all three of those people are soccer coaches. They were my soccer coaches. And guess what I did for 30 years in my life? I was a soccer coach. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing man. Oh, two words. Two words. I now I'm going to Unsung hero. That's what I'll tell you. That's what he was. Hi, my name's Derek. Um, I'm going to have a rough go of this. I'm thankful for Eric. <laughs> uh, my goodness. I had the privilege of. Can I say sure. If anybody else is afraid to talk, you saw mine. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Uh, I've had the privilege of playing soccer for Harold for many years. And um, there's a, uh, a common friend that, that Harold and I have, and uh, his name is Keith Cunningham. He is not able to be here today. Uh, he's at home taking care of his beautiful wife named Pam. And um, and so Keith had written something, and he shared it with um, some of the family. And um, they asked if he could share it. And uh, he obviously couldn't. And so he threw me under the bus. And so here I am to share. Uh, I'm honored to share uh, Keith's words uh, and memories of Harold. Um, it is a little long, so don't shoot the messenger. But uh, Keith's memories of Harold. Harold was a friend of mine for over 40 years. How would I describe him to those who did not know him? Not that there's anyone alive that does not know him. <laughs> he seemed to know everyone. First, he was kind. He did things for others all the time. He had a heart of gold. He was a carpenter. He made a living building exhibit displays for HP stubs and often traveled to install them. He built an addition on his house. In fact, just last week he was still working on it. He built beautiful furniture. He was a meticulous craftsman. Measure twice, cut once. No way. Measure once, cut once. He was a professional. He was a skateboard fan. I know he couldn't do laser flips or tail or backside tail slides. He left those to Eric. But I know he appreciated them. He was an honorary Sikh and reveled in Laura and Tage's week-long wedding. He loved his outfit and the food. Keith heard about that for weeks. He says I heard about that for weeks. <laughs> He may, for all I know, be an honorary Calgarian due to Chelsea, but if not officially given the key to the city, I am sure he thought he was deserving of it. 
He might have even made his own. He was a doting and proud grandpa to Leona, Kai, and Juniper. He was a babysitter, a coach, a chauffeur, a teacher, a confidant, and more. He was a storied videographer who honed his craft, filming professional soccer games for years at the Silver Dome and the Joe Louis Arena. Both those fields could speak. He was proud of his Native American heritage. He was a best friend to Andrea, Eric, and Laura. He was always there for them whenever they needed him. He had an eye for beauty and was a collector of art and architecture around him. He gave tours of his father's unique house. He was a staunch union man, and it goes without saying he was a Democrat and proud of it. He was known for his sartorial splendor, and at the same time, he danced to the beat of his own drum. I mean, how else could you explain the berets? <laughs> He was a reader and interested in a lot of topics. He was a culinarian and could cook with the best of them. He had, as what we refer to as the curse of the capable, there was almost nothing he couldn't do when he put his mind to it. And like every one of us, he had his faults. Yes, sometimes he bit off a little bit more than he could chew, but he still delivered more with his typical Herculean efforts than the rest of us mere mortals. He might not have been the best at follow through at times, but with such a long to-do list, how can you fault it? He made up with these minor faux pas with effort, zeal, and enthusiasm. Sorry. He was confident, honest, Adventurous, smart, compassionate, encouraging, blind to color a creed, and full of smiles. He was a soccer guy's guy. He was dedicated to it. You might say it was his calling, vice or passion. I think it was a passion but not as important as his wife, Pam. She was his true passion. There are a lot of soccer stories that we could tell about him. We could talk about how he arranged a cricket game with some of our favorite Brits, or our trip to watch the U.S. national team in Columbus, or how back in the day, the over 30 inter team was ranked in the top 10 amateur teams in the country he was so proud. Or how he merged our team with the Caribbean team and how the other teams complained about a break in music. <laughs> or how we went to watch the Columbus crew in Columbus. Or how he met Mia Ham so many years ago. Or how we actually had an international team of American, English, Jamaican, German, Haitian, Middle Eastern, Eastern European, Spanish, and French players all on the same team. This is actually how this soccer club came to be known as Intra. He did not care where we came from. He just cared that we were good people and good players. Keith's favorite story, he says here, he says, my favorite story about Harold takes place in an indoor game years ago. It was at an old decrepit golf dome next to a cement recycling plant. He says it was a game late in the season where a win was meaningful to both teams. We scored in the last few minutes to win, and the other team was PO'd. As we walked off, one of the players on the other team, uh, who did not seem to have a fluent understanding of the English language, jawed at Kirk. He really gave him the business. He was so frustrated, and he came at Kirk with one last ultimate insult. He exploded as the spit came out of his mouth. And you have ugly eyebrows! <laughs> I'm sure that he thought that he was using the equivalent insult from Sandlot. You throw like a girl. Which was designed to cause the earth to open up and swallow the insulted. Instead, Kirk 
burst out laughing. <laughs> wow. How could you feel? How would you feel if you just unleashed the ultimate insult only to be embarrassed by what was received from the shocked look on the insulter's face? It was obvious. Kirk honestly thought that that was the funniest thing anyone could say. <laughs> insult? You have to be kidding. That was just about the greatest thing you could say to him. He was proud of those eyebrows. <laughs> yes, he was a soccer legend. Yes, he is in the Hall of Fame. Every one of us in this room has stories we could tell. <clears throat> Keith reached out to some of our soccer friends and hear of some of what they said about Kirk. He was a great man, a big loss for Southeast Michigan. Soccer, sorry, Brian. A blessed guy, Jerome. He is irreplaceable, a true soccer fanatic. He will be greatly missed, Rossi. Kirk will never be forgotten. Such a genuinely good person, Nick Neighbors. He was a mainstay of Michigan soccer as well as a gentleman in all aspects of life. He will be sorely missed, Steve Armitage. He will be dearly missed, Rafi. Harold was a kind man. He will be deeply missed. He always showed passion for this sport we all love. He will be immensely missed, Archizio. He was definitely a fixture among the soccer landscape, Spiro. He was a great friend and a hell of a guy. I have known him for over 40 years, always a gentleman. The soccer fields of Michigan. Sorry again. The soccer fields of Michigan will be a lonely place without him. Fred, he was a great contributor to both the game and the community. He set the example for inclusion and camaraderie. And he will be sorely missed, Jeff Fletcher. Great man, an incredible ambassador, ambassador for the beautiful game, Steve Spacuzzi. Harold will forever be in our memories. He has had a true and lasting impression in this game. We love all in Michigan. Sean Sewell. Harold was a local legend. Scott Moche. I have over 20 years of good memories with Harold, and he definitely will be missed. This one hurts. Hug your loved ones, Jeremy. His contribution to Michigan soccer is unmeasurable. Joe Boyle. My first experience in outdoor soccer in the U.S. was with Intra, and it was Kirk that was the welcoming soul. He will be very much missed, Moises. My first experience was with soccer playing. Sorry, my first experience with soccer playing was because of Kirk. He started the soccer program at Shrine High School in 1981, my freshman year. He solely is responsible for my love of the game. If I hadn't had the opportunity to play in high school, I would have never played in my life. I have so much gratitude for him. Joe Murphy. He touched so many men's lives, including mine, my kill. <clears throat> my memories of Kirk are probably similar to everyone else's. The eyebrows, the beret, his considerable contributions to Michigan soccer, but most importantly, he was very kind and generous. He had many friends within the soccer community, and I am proud to be one of them. Jim Smith. He was a good soul. Kevin Smith. He was a father to all his players. Steve Olochek. He is such a great ambassador for the sport for so many and cares so much for many others. I'm honored to be his friend for 38 years, two years after I immigrated back to the U.S. I don't know how he managed to do so much for such a long time. We have, we have lost such a great, honest, happy, caring, and very personal man. He will be missed. Why? Great guy. Huge soccer bastard. Coach for decades. Decades. Always happy. Class act. Loved his workshop. Loved his kids and his grandkids. Very fitting how his last hours occurred. Toby B. Sad to hear, but sounds exactly how he would have liked his final act to play out. Certainly such an interesting guy, God bless Roy. You can obviously hear the pattern. Kind, caring, passionate, happy, 
and generous. He was a good man. <clears throat> on his last days, you heard he worked on his house that he loved. The house that's always going to be there for his family. And no surprise, he was coaching a soccer game. That game was Thursday evening at Pebble Creek in Southfield. It was a good, fair, hot, hard, it was a good, fair, hard fought game. And fittingly, Inter won. Inter over 41, 3 to 2 in the last 10 minutes. Afterwards, the team grilled brats and burgers and cheered beer. And on Kurt's way out, he shook players' hands and said, Isn't this just great? And even now I can hear him saying it. What's well, not to be great? It was a soccer game. It's not called a beautiful game for nothing. On a warm, beautiful spring night, with not a cloud in the sky, his team, made up his uh, made up of his friends, he has known for years. One. He was right. It is great. And while all of us will agree, it was a life with so much more to offer. He had a great day. <laughs> As all of us as friends can attest, he was loved and will be sincerely missed. <clears throat> he has left quite a legacy. We should all be so lucky. loved us and he helped us and I can't tell you how many times he was just been walking down the street and someone said top hi to him. Someone that obviously he's met before. And I think that's a really incredible thing. He deserves to be remembered. I'm really gonna miss him. He made a lot of things in that little <laughs> shop of his <laughs> We were all super into Harry Potter for a while, my cousins, and so he made his wants. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we got to choose the wood. He loved everyone here. He's going to remember everyone here. 
he was a really incredible person. He was caring and loving and truly who I want to be when I'm older. I'm going to love you and miss you, Grandpa. Because I knew coming would make it real, and I was really trying hard not to. for it to not be real. I love hearing all of the stories, and I've been reading them to my family. We've been crying about them, and I'm waking up in the middle of the night and checking to see what else is there, just because. Hearing about him. I didn't talk to him every day. And, and sometimes I wouldn't talk to him for a week or more. Just, you know, he's, he's busy. He's busy. And, uh, I think I'm more petty than my brother. But I, I feel jealous of the time that so many people got with him. And not not for me. I mean, like, as Eric said, like, there was never a question. And I know that there was never a question for him whether or not we you know, had love, but I mean, that's just not even a thing. <laughs> it's just never a thing. He always said, I love you. He always hugged. So it's never any question. But I mean, there's never enough time with the people you love. I wanted more for the pride, you know, I wanted more for the grin. Wanted more, and there were a lot of trips that we tried to plan that were not going to happen because there was <laughs> some kind of a soccer event going on. And and I, you know, I I know he in no way regrets, and I certainly would never have it any other way for him because he he knew where to find his friends. You know, he knew what time and where they were playing. He knew he could go go see them. And how incredible is that? How incredible is it to be able to know where to find your people any day of the week? Every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only religion, apparently. But, I mean, I think the miracle of my dad was that he could see these huge pictures, right? He could see the possibility. He would get really excited about 
you know, a cricket game or putting on this, you know, event or, you know, he could see how something was going to make a difference and bring people together. But he also, you know, some of the best times were sitting in the backyard with the coffee and just looking at, you know, the squirrels, <laughs> the birds. I mean, he, the last week, he was, he took all these pictures of the chipmunks, the raccoons that were coming through his roof <laughs> of, of the workshop that he spent so much time building. He took pictures of them and thought they were so cute and named them. You know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like they're destroying his roof, but they're adorable, you know. Head and something, huh? <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, he saw the big things, but he also saw all the little things, you know, and there was all the places I wanted to take him and have him see all the, all the beautiful places that, you know, he taught me to see. Um, and to be clear, like, it wasn't just soccer because my family loves art. We went to art festivals constantly when we were growing up and movies and music and he just he loved life he loved every expression of it and every not just human life actually i mean <laughs> you know it's just this connection is so he made it real every day, you know, every moment of every day. The feeling seen is so you know, he really did try to see everybody. And that's it's rare. Thank you all for everything that you that you gave us today and, and that you gave him every day because he was he just loved it. He just loved it. And he loved everybody. <laughs> and everybody loved him if you'd like to tell us so. <laughs>
like never did he, he like no matter what he always was the guy that like he, he loved everyone and, and we all knew and he had like this confidence it was weird like even the ones that didn't have confidence had confidence because he was like you got this you you have it you know um yeah here's the deal right come behind me so here's the deal <laughs> and you're like, and everyone like just loved being around him. Um, he gave that I can bring to the kids that I coached in the past, but continue to coach because, um, because I love it. I hope probably not as much, but even though I love it a lot, um, it's just you, you, you can do so much more than what you think you are doing. You know, you can do so much more without even trying. And the more you have to try, the more you're probably not doing. You know, when you do it because you just love them, love the game, love just people and want to do the right thing, that's what, what Kirk was. So, um, you know, what do you say about Kirk that his eyebrows didn't say, right? <laughs> you can bring one eyebrow up and you're like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But, um, you know, I, all I can say is about, you know, I don't know how to say it, but like, for me, it was like, cool man, cool. <laughs> it was a cool man. Yeah. I don't know how many times he would say that to everybody, like, cool man, <laughs> cool. <laughs> he was the greatest, he, he was the greatest. Like, he is literally the inspirational to all of us. And I, you know, I'm not a, I don't know how to impress people, but definitely, uh, Kurt deserved it. So, uh, uncomfortable, and I'll walk off in my bus. <laughs> <laughs> So I knew Kirk since I was seven. Seven or eight. Yeah, well, he gave me the nickname. <laughs> and he cuddled me once. So we were close. And he was more like a dad to me, really, than a brother in law, because I knew him from my whole life. And I had, first of all, I just want to say those of you who lost it up here, don't ever be embarrassed about showing your feelings. I didn't cry when my father died. We didn't have that relationship. We didn't have a relationship. He was tough on me. He was tough on Kirk. I call him Kirk. I, I don't think I knew Kirk's name was Harold until I was like 20. <laughs> <laughs> and we just called him Kirk. But he came into our lives and he was someone like I had never seen. Him. I honestly God, like we were kids that were seen and not heard. We were disciplined strictly. We didn't speak unless we were spoken to. And Kirk came into our house the first time with his guitar. <laughs> and he sang in front of my family, which is like, I would fear more than death. I mean, honestly, we just didn't do that. And I was amazed. I've never seen anybody with that kind of confidence who I mean, he didn't know us from Adam. And, you know, my family's all sitting there like, and he's singing, and he's got the expression on his face and the eyebrows up, and, and Michael wrote the boat ashore, and all these songs, songs that we were just, I was just amazed by him. And he made my world bigger. He made everybody's world bigger because he was the least judgmental, biggest hearted. No prejudice. I know it, all of you said this before. I, I don't know. I apologize to all the soccer people because I moved to California when I was 19. Kirk drove me to the airport <laughs> in a blizzard. It was April. And I mean, I wish all of you had a dollar for every airport run that Kirk made because <laughs> he was like a shuttle service <laughs> with all the kids, all the relatives. One time my plane got diverted and I ended up they ended up busing us from Chicago to downtown Detroit. And Kirk came down to pick me up at the bus station in the middle of Detroit. And I'm like, you know, freaking out. And he shows up and he says, hey, 
let's stop at this donut shop on the way. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, middle of the night. You know, that this Dutch girl is a Dutch girl. Yeah. Donut. Yeah. We don't buy their Christmas. And it was open, you know, and and like Chris didn't just know the counter person, but he knew the guy that baked the donuts, and he knew the guy that washed the dishes, and he knew that guy outside that walked parked the cars. You know, he just you couldn't go anywhere with him without him running into someone that was a friend. And so he taught me a lot about generosity of spirit and that kind of acceptance. And he was always just that person that you could go to for the big smile and the big hug. And and he, he, and he hugged you like he meant it. He just hugged you. He liked bear hugs. And that was, you know, those are the things that I remember. So Kirk had flaws. So I tell you, he had a couple of flaws. When I would come home for vacation, we would have these debates, and I would tell him, Kirk, you're spoiling your kids rotten. <laughs> And I would tell them, you know, you can't just always do everything for them. You have to let them learn on their own, make a few mistakes. And he would look at me, listen to me for a while, and then he'd go, but Jackie, you know, they're my kids. <laughs> and I have to tell you that, you know, I didn't have that with my father. So to me, the way he felt about God was just, and I have to tell you, you know, Our hero. You've always been our hero. 
He's always been our hero. He was always there for us. My sister took us to this crazy rainbow gathering. <laughs> it was like a hippie thing, and hippies were like 20 years in the past. <laughs> and um, my sister got sick, and we had to take her to the hospital. I called my parents, and they just, you know, they just drove there. They drove, we had to take back other cars. Other people were sick, they put them in the cars. Like, <laughs> he was always there for us. If we were sick, he brought soup. If we, you know, I mean, there was, he would, I know this is terrible to say, but when you're a kid and back in the day, my dad got me the tampon because my mom was dry. <laughs> so like, I could ask my dad, like, you, you know, I was 10. No, he didn't. He never cared. He never cared. And and I mean, these are things that like we probably shouldn't say because like my mom said, it's being live streamed or whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> my mom has not pumped gas in like thirty years. So my dad my dad's been taking care of us. I mean, he took care of me. He I mean anything. My daughter. Leona, I mean, anything with dad, I have to work, I'm, I'll be there, I'm there. Like, Leona would text from school, like, I need to get here and there, like, he was always there. I was, you know, when I had to work, he was there. Um, so I was starting this little over there. Um, I told him when he died, we were at the, uh, we were at the, um, after what Derek said, he, he was found like only 15 minutes or so after, not even, and they took him to the hospital. And um, and the one thing I wanted to tell my dad, I put my arms around him and I said, Dad, you saw us through. We're all okay. We're all made it to adulthood. So what the like, crazy thing? Eric skateboarding like we thought for sure. Like, I don't know. <laughs> My daughter's 14, like I always worry about her. And I said, Dad, you saw us through, and you know, mom's a brute underneath. She will, my mom's like amazingly strong. She, my dad did everything, but my mom is amazingly strong. And, and I was telling people, she is like, you know, like I said, she was the one that like held down the fort. We always felt like my dad would do anything outside the home and my mom would always like be there. So we could call mom if we were like, mom. But my dad would be like, oh, I'm there. So, um, so I want to say thank you for seeing us through dad to adulthood. Thank you for being Leona's babysitter, tutor, guide, and grandfather. When my dad found out that Leona was a little behind in reading, every day he would read with her every day and they're reading really hard books i'm like she's behind the reading. <laughs> <laughs> reading giant chapter books <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for being there for us through all of it thank you for being i want to say thank you for his his great grandparents were swedish they lived in wisconsin and he took us to Wisconsin and he would take us to powwows there. We we're part of the Ho Chunk Nation. My father is part of the Ho Chunk Nation. Billy, his cousin, is here. We're so happy. They were wild children. They were wild. <laughs> My dad was wild. He said that he was like, I don't even know what age. Billy, what age were you guys running around Chicago together? And, well, he's a little older than I was, but yeah, he was in his early teens. Yeah, early teens, running around Chicago doing all sorts of stuff. He said he was in a gang, like, <laughs> you know, like, there's so many things we didn't know. Um, and when we would meet the relatives from all over, they would tell us. <laughs> um, but I was going to say thank you for taking us to Wisconsin. He never said, don't pick up the snake. He never said that. He was like, he loved bugs and snakes and we're all like, ooh, interesting spider, you know? Like, we just don't have that in us. Like, the nature thing is, is my dad, we brought home frogs, some of them dried up, it was not good. <laughs> um, and then they, I had a feeling that my mom must have released them every night because they, you know, we never got to keep any of them. Like, they were gone the next day, and I was like, I'm not keeping any of those. Um, I went to, so
So another thing is my parents, as much as they completely believed in us and told us every day, like, you know, I had a lot of um, issues when I was younger and they would always say, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you can do anything. That was like the mantra, like we always heard that. And, um, and so I decided to go to Peru by myself one time and my dad said, here, take these. He gave me a soccer jersey and a bunch of coins to flip, <laughs> like that you flip at the, uh, like what is it called where you flip them? To see who, which team goes first or which team plays, whatever. What is it called? Top stop. Yeah, okay, so he, so he gave me those. I passed them out to, because it's like you only can take certain cabs and that kind of stuff, and so I gave it to the cab drivers, to my, you know, to the people on the Amazon, and they were just like, it was like a, it was like a beautiful road, like a golden road to like, just whatever, <laughs> just because of the soccer stuff. Um, I don't want to forget my dad's passion. He loved photography. Um, we'd go to Cranbrook and we would climb as high as we could, and he would record it with photography. Like he'd always be like. And my mom would freak out when she saw the photographs. Um, we climbed the we climbed the pine trees. He'd never say get down. Um, he'd always try to include me. Um, he, you know, he he videotaped everything. Um, he worked with the Express, the Lightning, the Rockers. Like these are all professional teams that no longer exist in Detroit, but we're sad to go. Um, the last time. Uh, I went on vacation with my dad. We were worried about my Aunt Renee. Um, <coughs> on my dad's side, it's his half-sister. And we were very worried about her. And he hadn't talked to a lot of the family. And he was nervous because he hadn't talked to a lot of the family and didn't know if he would be accepted. <laughs> so everybody has their insecurities. He didn't know if we'd be accepted. And um, so I drove him down to North Carolina, and when we got there, um, the whole family came to dinner. And my dad was just like beside himself with happiness. And um, I just want to say that, you know, we want to say that um, thank you for sharing all your memories with us. And um, it's just, you know, there's so many things we don't know, and just thank you, and please keep sharing. Don't worry about making us sad. We, we want to hear everything. And I just want to want to tell you one more thing, and that was that. Um, oh, okay, sorry, mom. Uh, my mom was his greatest love. He always thought that he was the most handsome man on earth, and that my mom was the most beautiful woman. And when he first saw her, I'm just gonna say, it, mom. Do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I won't say it. I won't say it. I won't say it. Okay, I won't say it. Anyways, he thought she was the most beautiful one. I'll put it there. And um, and she thought he thought she was, you know, like just fantastic, whatever. So um, so they were a very loving pair, and I, it was so nice to see my dad, like, you know, kiss my mom every day, and you know, it's just really. Uh, so we are going to miss him terribly. And the last thing I was going to say is that uh, he was the only guy that always that came to girls night and stayed. And that happened several <laughs> times with my girlfriends. So he came to girls night and ended up staying the whole night with us talking. So um, dad, you will always be one of the girls. <laughs> the other thing he did say was that uh, men and women love me. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for uh, for sharing. If anybody has anything else to share, but we're so happy. It was so nice to just see everybody. You know, friends of ours who came, um, all the soccer players that we love, all of our family, and. Um, and I'm still seeing so many people that I, you know, that I know that I know meant so much to my dad. So, so thank you. Thank you.
didn't plan on speaking, but I feel like I should, and I have a lot to say. I think I guess I found a way to be my dad, my coach, and my best friend. <laughs> Sorry. And in elementary school, he would always drive me home from school, and we'd tell these stories about my pets. Usually they were centered around my pets at the time, and going on these crazy adventures and fighting heroes and stuff. And we did that for so long. And I have all these crazy stories of the stuff we came up with. Um, When we would get home at the dinner table, he would always have these stories that just from his, his experiences that he would tell would be a new one every day. They were really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of my favorites was, I don't even know how this came up, but he told me he was a caddy for the mafia people at this golf place <laughs> and just stuff like that. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dave and um, I had the pleasure of knowing Harold for over 20 years. Grew up me in, uh, I don't know, maybe 2000, my brother and I, we were younger players and uh, I think he was like doing like re like adult regionals in Farmington, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we didn't you know we were just like labor for him, got out there and had beers with him after. But you know that's that's when I kind of got into Harold's life a little bit. And over the years, I was able to get a lot closer with him, um, administrating at the state level, and you know he became a, a real close friend and mentor to me. And, um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with him over beers, talking through problems, just working through how we were going to make soccer better in Michigan. And, um, you know, it hit me, hit me pretty hard. You know, we, um, I played for Intra for, for a number of years. And I'm in a different club now, and we were actually supposed to play him earlier, but we had field problems, so we didn't get to, we didn't get to play um, yet this, uh, this season. But um, I found out, you know, on my, I was up, on my way up to Petoskey to coach a, a girls tournament, and, you know, it, it hit me pretty hard. But it was really touching to see, you know, players from my club who barely even know what league we play in, and the, the chat thread was just going crazy. You know, everybody knew, you know, everyone. And um, it's been really touching. We, you know, we kicked off Thursday, and before the, before every match, you know, everyone remembers Harold. Moment of silence, photographs. It's just. It's, it's really awesome to see, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi everyone, my 
my name is my name is Hua Din, and um, I'm so glad, so honored, you know, this fine gentleman. Forty years ago, I came to the United States, and I was somehow I made it to Ferndale High School faculty. And um, within a year or two later, two years later, I met Carol. So the first thing that um, um, I saw him, and he came and he introduced, and the first thing he, when he introduced, he hugged me. And it's so unusual in my culture um, because. In my culture, when the elderly say certain things, or when, you know, they, they don't normally come and hug you. Nowadays, it's a little bit different, but back then, 30 some years ago, right? And I came here when I was 14. It's such a surprise. To, and you hear everybody talk about how he you know, loves everybody, so how him is passionate about uh, sport, about soccer. And that's where I learned that from when I came to this country. I feel that so much love, so many people around me that really want to welcome me as an immigrant to this country and fulfill the life of the American, the freedom, the love that everybody has for each other. So as time goes along, I have been with him for the last 38 years. I play for Intra over 20 years now. I used to play for this open age, 30 and over, 40 and over. <laughs> and then he asked me to play for him with 48 and over. <laughs> but I already committed to another team. So Every so often, he needs somebody, he calls me up, ah, can you come out? I need help. So I come out and play with him, and every time I see him, a big smile and a big hug. And every time, just like Jared's mentioned, isn't it great? Isn't it beautiful playing soccer? And he gets to know my family as well. Um, get to know my wife, every so often, my wife comes to the game. So same thing, hug the picture with the, um, <laughs> my kids, same way, asking, how are you doing? How are you soccer coming along? How are you school? So, and they love to be here. They had, you know, how teenagers, they have things going on, and, you know, they're all over places, so um, they are fortunate to be here. Um, so for all the time that um, we did together, my last time I uh, received a hug from um, Kurt. That's what when he first introduced. And just recently, I learned that his first name is Harold. As well. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, so two two weeks ago, actually two weeks ago Thursday, I received the last hug. Um, and at that game, we, after the game, we have a beer together, and we celebrate 30 years that we knew each other. And I did not know that was the last time I was going to see him. See him. The last time I saw him. So, last, last week, because of work related, and I could make it to the game. And later on, when I got a um, message from Derek, and basically, I just feel like something is missing. So, a lot of things that he had taught me, and he told me just two things: that love and passion. When you have love, you can do many things. When you have passion that motivates you to do the right thing. And 
I believe that's your smile. And a lot of that that give me the confidence and help me through a lot of different challenges in life. And I really appreciate that. And I thank you for that help. And God bless you. Thank you. Page. Um, I'm Kirk's son in law. <clears throat> it's impossible to encapsulate. Right? You want to tell a whole story. And you can't. Because each and every one of you has your own relationship. And for each of every and every one of you, and all of us, he's a slightly different person. And we all get to see him through our own lens. And that's how we should see him. And at the same time, it's a terrible joy and a horrible privilege to get to hear how you saw it. I think that Kirk was not a person, despite his massive collection of jerseys. <laughs> care too much about the things that he had. And I think that when we measure a person's life, we measure it by the feelings that they left behind. Kirk has left a massive space. It'll never be exactly filled. It can't be. But he's also left a legacy. We've talked, you know, definitely people have talked, and I've talked throughout the day with people about all the things that he loved and was passionate about. There are a couple things I think it's important to remember that he did not like at all. He had no place for intolerance. He had no place for bigotry. He had no place in his life for disrespecting refs. <laughs> he had no place in his life 
for people being unkind to other people. What he did have was incredible patience. An ability to capture joy, a willingness to try new things at every time of his life, desire to be brave, and the strength to do right by his family. There are a lot of ways that you can celebrate it. One of the ways that I'd suggest to maybe think about is that Kurt did not love pay to play. The fact that in order to play a game that he loved, kind of had to have money it was something that troubled him deeply. There's kids out there who want to play, who can. I would encourage the soccer community to find a way to help kids with that in his name. I would encourage all of us to remember to be vulnerable to help each other, to give each other rides and take food <laughs> and take water to the games because he can't do that now, to put up the corner flags, and remember to take them back down, <laughs> and to make sure the beer is at least half cold, <laughs> <laughs> and be kind to each other. situation where we would really love to have everybody go out to dinner. We didn't plan the evening or tonight because we thought it was going to run late. We weren't sure what was happening. Right now we run to the house. We have food there. If people would like to come and there's more that we'll order more in. Um, it's right in Royal Oak. I'm trying to think how we can get this. I think we can get this stuff down the track. You know, but there's some real mural soccer players in the house. So. Oh, okay, so she thinks we might get help to get this down. So if anybody's interested and wants to hang out, you know, wants to talk to their family or people out of town or people you haven't seen for a while, um, Andre has the address. Um, 304 Oak. 304 Oak, yeah. Through this. Fairly spacious, there's a lot of rooms, and you know, everybody can sit around and relax and have some lunches. And what we don't have there, we'll order in as salads and taco bar or something like that. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, it's kind of a weird thing. We didn't know really how to plan this for the, for the evening. We're trying to get everything else done. But um, if you like to stop by, we'd love to see you. and. Um, We'll, we'll manage it when we get there. We'll carry out everywhere nowadays. <laughs> so, um, but we do have some things there ready to go. So, um, how long do you think? No, we'll just have some people there. So we'll just have some people to stay. Yeah, some people.
he's so getting there. So three or four, because it's pretty, pretty close to here. And um, we'll, we'll handle it. We'll be, you know, if we see every show up, if there's not enough, we'll get more. And we'd like to see you all. Don't hesitate to come if you are free for the evening. And basically, we just have to clear this out somehow. We'll get more. That's the problem we had with this. Without heat, uh, we are having cremated, which is his wishes. And so that's um, a situation that we're still scheduling with the funeral home. And um, they will let us know what the date is. So it will be a private family situation. So this is kind of the, kind of the last chance for us all to get together. Anyhow, and all the residents you have to be game too, so that's okay too. That's a, that's a tribute as well if you're going to the game. So, but I thank everybody. We've been reading some of the comments, and, and there's people, you know, that are you know from out of town, people that couldn't make it, people that are in town that couldn't make it. You know, um, the as I said before, this will be uh, this will be on YouTube. We'll check it out, but um, we'll figure out a way. There's, I think there's cards there on the way up. I hope everybody signs the register so they can be in touch with you with the current address. The only other thing we would love to know is if you got my dad one of the. If you, if you um, were someone that brought one of the jerseys to my dad, we would love to know where the jerseys came from. So we don't know where all the jerseys came from. So if you if you know and you can leave a card next to it. The story of the, the jersey, that'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. And it's 304 Oakdale, if anybody. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. We really greatly appreciate it. We hope to see you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.